my lowest moment in, in, a, in a moment where um, I wanted to throw in a towel. It really wasn't me. I, 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 as much as I wanted to quit, I couldn't even quit. Sometimes I joke and say, I'm like, you know, I was just like, my God, what else can go wrong? I can't even quit right, you know? <laughs> and right. so that was sort of my moment in the sand where when I tried to quit and that wasn't going to work for me, then I just said, you know what, I'm just going to live every day like it's my last. Mm -hmm. And then that's when I started to kind of push back. That's when I decided that I wanted to, to stay in the Army and continue to serve. Hello, fellow leaders, and welcome to the Military Leader Podcast, bringing you conversations with today's most successful leaders. I am Andrew Stedman, and I want to thank you for checking out the podcast today and let you know that you can find this episode and many others over at themilitaryleader.com. And while you're there, I encourage you to check out the resources and articles and insight on leader development, uh, growing organizations and building teams. And then while you're there, you can also connect on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and join the leader development conversation that is happening every day in the military leader community. So today's episode is an in-person chat that I was fortunate to have with retired Army Colonel Greg Gatson. Colonel Gatson served for 25 years as a field artilleryman, graduating from West Point in 1989, and then serving in every major conflict until taking command of 232 Field Artillery Battalion at Fort Riley, Kansas. Then while deployed in Iraq in May of 2007, a powerful improvised explosive device struck his up-armored Humvee, ejecting him from the vehicle and severely damaging both his legs and his right hand. Yeah, several times in the days and weeks afterward, he nearly died. He did die, actually, and had to be resuscitated by the medical personnel who cared for him, with whom he credits his life, along with PFC Eric Brown, who applied the tourniquets to his leg after the blast. Colonel Gatson ended up losing both of his legs above the knee, threatening his ability to continue serving. But then one day during his long recovery, uh, which he talks about in this interview, Colonel Gatson reached a point where he committed to fight back and continue serving in the Army. Colonel Gatson went on to 06 level command, serving as the garrison commander of Fort Belvoir, Virginia. But his unique story of service doesn't stop there. And as you'll hear him describe, he has continued to impact and inspire organizations and military units in the years since his injury. He even got to mentor the New York Giants during multiple winning seasons, earning two Super Bowl rings and becoming an honored member of their team. Colonel Gatson was kind enough to sit down with me before he shared his story and lessons with the hundreds of leaders here at the National Training Center, and his journey is an inspiration, but so is his message. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Colonel Greg Gatson. So, Colonel Greg Gatson, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to, to to join me here for the Military Leader Podcast audience. You're an inspiration to many, um, but I wanted to ask you, who inspires you? No, I say my my parents, who have both passed, grew up in the segregated South, and and just um, you know understanding and appreciating what what they went through and the, the challenges they had to go through in life have certainly. Um, you know, giving me the, the belief of, you know, what's possible, what's, uh, you know, just, you know, living your life and, and taking mm -hmm. on your challenges and, 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 uh, and, uh, and, and keeping things, I guess, in perspective, if you will. Um, uh, what inspires me is, 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 is I, I think just being my best, mm -hmm. you know, understanding, um, how fragile and how short life is and, and understanding that, you know, you, you only have one chance to, to, to be your best. And so I, I, I really try to keep it simple and, mm -hmm. and just uh, try, try to live up to being the best I can be. Mm -hmm. Did your parents show a, a resilience when you were a kid growing up? Did they, they bear a lot for the family? Well, um, for sure. I mean, my parents, uh, uh, you know, put themselves through college while, I, well, you know, they had me before they were, and my sister before they were even uh, done with their, their undergraduate. Mm -hmm. But again, um you know, the, 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 the really appreciate, you know, you know, having the, my, my father having to pick cotton and growing up in the, the Jim Crow South and the segregated mm -hmm. South and, and, and 
you know, rising above that um, mm-hmm. uh, was significant to me, very significant. Mm-hmm. And 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 um, and so, you know, when you see what they've overcome, um, you sort of have instilled it that you can overcome, that you can achieve, that you can you can rise to you know um, any situation that uh, you're confronted with. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Um, so speaking of challenging situations, you know, you, you deployed as a battalion commander, right? In, in, uh, um, or in late 2006, 2007. Yeah. 2000. Yep. Yep. Right after here, but ironically, uh, uh, finished the NTC deployment in, uh, November of 2006 <laughs> uh-huh. and, you know, started deploying in, in, uh, late January of 2007 uh-huh. as part of the surge. Uh-huh. Yep. Yes, sir. Yep. Yeah. I was right there, right there behind you a few months. Yep. Um, what what was your approach as a as a battalion commander? What, what did you talk to the troops about before you before you guys deployed? Well, um, uh, I, I, in the most loose terms, I, I had a, a I say an atypical situation. First of all, when I took command, it wasn't a unit. The unit didn't exist, so you okay. almost have to. If you're familiar with, we were soldiers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, um, my brigade and the battalion, I was, we were, we were started from scratch. I mean, I was okay. literally the third or fourth individual to sign into my unit. Oh, so, no okay. so we were, yeah. we were starting from, from scratch. Mm-hmm. And so, um, that in itself, I thought was a, a challenge because, mm-hmm. you know, you, I, I, I like to say often is that, um, I didn't have to look, you know, I couldn't blame the person before me because there mm-hmm. was anybody. And mm-hmm. so, um, you know, there was a lot of, um, I don't want to say pressure, but, uh, but I, you know, I, I took, you know, the, 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 ex, the expectation that, you know, these are my guys. These were tr- mm-hmm. literally my, my guys. And, and I needed to make sure that they were prepared, uh, to do whatever, you know, the army was going to ask us to do. Mm-hmm. And so that's what, you know, motivated me. That's what in, inspired me. Uh, understanding that, um, you know, when you know you're going to come to combat, it, this is life and death. Mm-hmm. And, um, and we don't want to sacrifice, uh, or take shortcuts on, on, on the standards and knowing w- what we need to do. There, mm-hmm. um, there's consequence for, for those kind of shortfalls. Mm-hmm. And, and the irony for me is that, um, you know, driven by that, understanding, truly understanding and appreciating that, that, um, you know, m- my life was literally in the hands of the, the very men I was responsible for training. Right, right. Um, uh, before I ask you about the incidents, or do you remember how the rotation went for you? Was it a good experience out here in the desert? Um, it, it was. I mean, you know, they're they're not meant to be Kate walks. You know, everybody says, well, yeah. all these bad things don't happen at once, and of course, but you got a thirty day thing, so you're, it's a it's an accelerated timeline. I can I can tell you, it's. Um, the, the, the first time I was here was, um, was I was a second lieutenant mm-hmm. and, uh, and we, we didn't finish our rotation because we were pulled out to, uh, to deploy for Operation Desert Shield. Oh, so okay. the, the two times I was here, uh, they were all, they all were followed by deployments. And the first okay. time wasn't even, wasn't even completed because of, um, because of the decisions that were made. Um, coming back a second time, I mean, I had a whole lot of life and perspective under me. And so, um, I, you know, I didn't feel overly, uh, stressed, just appreciated that, you know, these are, um, it's about a, a chance to make sure that we develop and have the systems and can look mm-hmm. critically at the things that we need to do mm-hmm. to make sure that we can do it right. And, and it's, it's, you know, and that's, you know, it's meant and it's designed to, for you to find your imperfections. And to find your shortfalls, not exactly. to not to validate that you're you know king of the hill and you got to do everything right. That's yeah. that's far from it. And so, yeah. um, I think that maturity um, it helps you appreciate uh, what what uh, the training experience about mm-hmm. this is. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a good point about here. I think people come down, they try to win it, they try to get it perfect. Yeah, it's, you know? yeah, it's not about winning. You know? No, it's about yeah. uh, preparing you to to win where when it really counts. That's right. Yeah, this is just practice. It's right, practice out here. Yeah, right. Um, so May of 2007, sir, that's, you know, that's yep. an incredibly tough day, probably the toughest of your life there. Um, can you, would you mind describing for us what, what, what happened there and how the, your, you know, your soldiers took care of you afterward and. Right. Um, let's say a normal day in, in chaotic Baghdad in early 07. Um, I had, I had a few engagements with, um, uh, with, uh, Iraqi leaders at, 
excuse me, I know it was, um, it was a long day. And at the end of the day was a memorial service for, um, uh, two soldiers in the STB of my brigade that were mm-hmm. killed about, uh, three days earlier, uh, first Lieutenant, uh, Jones and, and, and special Sunson, mm-hmm. um, you know, it had paid in full measure. Um, I remember, uh, for some reason, I mean, um, it, again, it was a very violent time in Baghdad and, and it was, you know, you can recall it was very typical that, that somewhere in the country, a U.S. service member was killed. That was almost daily. Right. And, um, but I think the fact that these two men were from Fort Riley and they had it, you had a chance to, to really process where they were from and who they were. And, you know, they were from your home post and, and that you were at a memorial service for them. Um, I, I honestly remember that sticking with me um, maybe a little bit longer than, than it normally would have sure. in those early months. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I honestly, at times, probably that uh, in my mind, at least kind of question whether or not we were, we were making progress, whether it was worth it, you know, whether, mm-hmm. you know, what their family was going through, what, you know, what their thoughts were about this huge sacrifice that their families had just mm-hmm. made. Um, as I was, you know, heading back, these were some of the things that uh, were kind of going through my mind. And then, you know, bam, I, that's when my vehicle was hit. Um, you know, the blasts, you know, I was in a, uh, brand new 1151 mm. up armored Humvee, you know, blasts. I can remember feeling the vehicle lift off the road and it, and it blew me out of the truck. And mm. I can remember hitting the ground and coming to a rolling stop on my back. And so I was like, first I was just pissed because I knew it was an IED. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was just like, you know, I don't get, you know, I, you know, it's amazing. The, the, you can crystally remember these thoughts as they go through your head. I mean, very organized and almost like time slows by. I mean, I, I went from, from being pissed to like, you know, how dare these, you know, mm-hmm. how dare them? I'm like trying to make life better for these folks and mm-hmm. they're, you know, they're fucking trying to kill me. And, and then, uh, and then the realization that I was seriously wounded. Um, as I was lying there on my back, I couldn't get up. I couldn't move. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I said, God, I don't want to die in this country. And then I was out. I mean, it was black. Um, my, uh, my, the senior non-commissioned officer in my patrol, uh, first Sergeant Frederick Johnson would be the first to arrive at my vehicle when it finally came to a stop. Mm-hmm. He was the one that recognized that I was missing. And was the first to find me where he began to resuscitate me. And one of my young, um, soldiers, um, a, a young private, uh, PFC named Eric Brown would actually put the tourniquets on my legs, mm-hmm. um, which is significant because the doctors, uh, give him credit for saving my life. You know, giving me, um, he did such a great job at that, um, that, um, that's what, uh, that's what gave me a fighting chance to, that's to right. live. Um, ultimately, you know, that would get me in a vehicle and get me evac back to, uh, Falcon, mm-hmm. um, medevac would come and get me there and take me to the cache. You know, that night, um, I would go through about 129 units of blood, um, probably died five or six times, um, on the operating table. So, um, um, but you know, none of that would have been in place had those um, men, uh, uh, res- didn't, if they didn't respond in the, in the efficient and professional way that they, they did. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's, um, and so that's why, you know, our standards matter. That's why um, doing things the right way matters. And, um, you know, I, I believe I continue to, to echo those um those sentiments and share those lessons that uh, what you do does matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in this way, kind of like what you were saying about being an NTC down here, you know, you enforce the standards, make sure everyone's trained. But in this case, it was literally back 
to to you at where right. that training came back to. Right. And it's the details, you know, people load plans. Why do all vehicles gotta be loaded the same way? So you can find things in the dark yeah, in the, yeah. in chaos. Mm -hmm. You you uh you take a little bit of the chaos out of chaos when when things are organized. Yeah, and yeah. and so um you know, I, I just again, I, I, it's a, it's a, it's a passion, I guess, to, to remind people that our standards do matter, and, and you know, bad things happen when, when, when individuals start taking their standards in their own hands. Mm -hmm. You know, one guy takes a shortcut, and another guy takes a shortcut, and another guy takes a shortcut, and then you have a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. You know, you have mm -hmm. something really bad happen, and, and that's because people are taking liberties with the standards. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. Yeah. Just read about that in Simon Sinek's new book. Uh, he discusses that ethical fading mm -hmm. and it's little, little bits here and there yeah, over years wrote, and that's years. That's right. And that's when you have something bad happen. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, so you, you woke up and realized that your life was changed now. Well, um, so I was, uh, again, I was wounded on the 7th of May. I would go through Balad to Longstuhl, the Germany, the, the common, Right out of Baghdad, arriving in uh, in Washington D.C. at Walter Reed on the on the 11th of May, so just four days after being mm -hmm. wounded, um, intubated on a feeding tube in an induced coma. But I still had my legs. Uh, they were they were operating on me every other day to repair my blood vessels and and clean out my wounds. Um, um, about a week after being at Walter Reed, I think on the 18th of May. The blood vessels in my left leg could no longer sustain blood flow, and I started to bleed to death in the ICU. Okay. The nurse pulled off her belt, put a fuel expedient tourniquet on my leg, and they took me into surgery and amputated okay. my left leg above the knee to save my life. The next day, the same thing happened on my right leg, but they were able to pull a vein from my left bicep and put in my right leg and save my right leg. Now, by this point, I, I was out of my induced coma and able to communicate uh, with the doctors. And ultimately, I made the decision for the doctors to amputate mm -hmm. my right leg. Mm -hmm. And on the 24th of May, um, they did that. When I came out of surgery, they gave me some more great news. They discovered that my right arm and elbow were broken and would require surgery to uh, repair those. So about a week or so later, I had that surgery. And unfortunately, complications from that surgery, um, I sustained ulnar and radial nerve damage on my right arm, and, and my right arm would uh, lock up due to a phenomenon called heterotopic ossification. My body was producing too much calcium, and it basically fused my uh, arm uh, okay. at the elbow at a right angle. Okay. I couldn't pick up my wrist because of my uh, nerve damage on my right hand. So I was functionally down to one limb. Mm. My non-dominant left arm was all I could use at this point. And uh, that was, I, I like to say, the straw that broke the camel's back. I was just devastated. I mean, um, I think in, generally, in general terms, I seem to handle the loss of my legs um, and, a f and fairly in stride. I mean, um, but but when I lost the use of my right arm and hand, I, I mean, I'm just like, mm -hmm. you know, what next? Yes, right. And yeah. um, and I, I, I you know, I, I I have to admit that I I I, I say I personally kind of quit. I personally tried to give up, or or felt like I that was all I could do. And um, and what I remind. Um, I think, I think a core of, of my message uh, that I speak about is, and so we go back to, you know, what we do every day. You know, our habits become our character. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so um, in my lowest moment, in, in, a, in a moment where um, I wanted to throw in a towel, it really wasn't me. I, 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 as much as I wanted to quit, I couldn't even quit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes I joke and say, I'm like, you know, I was just like, my God, what else can go wrong? I can't even quit right, you know? <laughs> and right. so that was sort of my moment in the sand where when I tried to quit and that wasn't going to work for me, then I just said, you know what? I'm just going to live every day mm -hmm. like it's my last. Mm -hmm. And then that's when I started to kind of push back. That's when I decided that I wanted to, 
to stay in the army and continue to serve. Okay. And, yes, sir. I was wondering if there was a, and just a catalyst let it, and Just let there. it loot. Just like, I don't care. You know, what else can happen to me? Right. Nothing. So, right. so I'm, I'm just going to throw caution to the wind yeah. and, um, you know, stay in a moment and just, and just savor every day, uh-huh. um, um, and, and make the most of it. Do you think it changed your outlook on life? Well, I, not, uh, you know what? It's, in, it's enhanced it. I, I don't think it fundamentally changed it. Mm-hmm. I think the, the core of who I was there, but, but this experience certainly enhanced it. It mm-hmm. gave me a different lens and a different way to appreciate what I kind of fundamentally knew, yeah. but, but not to the anywhere close to the, to sure. the level that I, I experienced this. Uh-huh. Yes, sir. So the, um, how about the wounded warrior community that you are now just immersed in? I mean, right. it's a whole new side of the army that, you know, you never. Yeah. You know what? So, uh, so I, I, this is a great forum. So the term wounded warrior, I've, uh, I've struggled with that term because, um, it's not how I define myself. Okay. You know, um, I'm a warrior. I'm a warrior mm-hmm. and I'm a warrior now that happened to be wounded. There was a, uh, th- that has been wounded, but I'm not, I don't continue to be wounded. That is not, okay. uh, you know, okay. I don't lead with I'm a wounded warrior. Mm-hmm. I'm a warrior. And oh, by the way, I was wounded 12 years ago, mm-hmm. but that's not, that's, that's not, not my not defining moment. That that's not the yeah. badge that I have to, uh, you know, that I have to display up front. Right. Now, some people might argue, well, you can't really hide it. That's true, but that's not how I define myself. Right. right. I'm not. You know, I'm not defining myself by a set of circumstances mm-hmm. or a set of events. Mm-hmm. You know, look, I went to West Point. I've never worn my ring. Mm-hmm. I play football. I don't have bumper stickers on my car. I mean, not that I'm. Uh, I, um, I share it. I share it. You know, the thousands. Mm-hmm. But that's. But uh, but I don't define myself by. You know. You know, my spirit badges or my accomplishments. Right. You know, um, right. You know, I don't wear Super Bowl rings. People uh-huh. ask me that all. Why don't uh-huh. you wear them? Oh, because they're big, bulky, and, and, and it's not something I do. It's right. not me. Right. Right. That's not what you want to, want to lead with, right? right. That's, right. uh, right. there are parts of you that are bigger than that, parts of you that, you know, endure for a right. stronger presence and longer for that. Yeah. Right. Uh, that's a powerful perspective, I think. Um, and whether it's whatever, you know, badge or whatever label some people go through, uh, whether it's in their career or in personal life, mm-hmm. I, I think that accepting the fact that you don't have to be defined by whatever that is, I think yeah, is right, important. Right. Like you've been to Ranger talk. School, right? Mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm sure you've met people that are still talking about Ranger School you know, <laughs> right, right. 28 years ago. You right, know, I was like, right. dude, that, move on. I, yeah. I, you know, right. I, and I'm not being pejorative, please. Sure. But, right. but, but in, you know, I think in listening to people talk about different things, accomplishments they're defining their lives by something that's in the past and Mm -hmm. and i think as leaders what we what we're challenged with is every day proving ourselves and and re and earning that leadership every day it's not it's not a credential that allows you to sit back and do nothing Mm -hmm. you've got to freaking earn yeah exactly there's a great phrase in the special operations community that uh, says selection never stops right every day you keep earning and keep pushing yeah absolutely um good and that's and that goes into uh, that's great but that that goes into really about being your best every day Mm -hmm. that's what we want that's what we want to be the character of our individuals and the character of Mm -hmm. our organizations that we're not we're not complacent but it's about living up to our best that we could be every day Yeah, yeah absolutely sir um, well, uh, so you mentioned football, you mentioned rings. So let's, let's talk about this for a second, if you don't mind. So how in the world did you come to have a Super Bowl ring? Uh, two. So, um, so, uh, you know, as, um, you know, being, when I got wounded, you, you know, I say sometimes you wonder about paying it forward. Well, um, maybe, uh, a lot of ways that that's where it, it, it came to fruition and, and I was just, amazed at the the community of support from my family from my friends from uh, i mean my first battalion commander my first battery commander Mm -hmm. retired came to visit me in the hospital and 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 so um in the same that same vein one of my classmates and teammates from west point who was a coach in the New York Giants came to visit me, mm-hmm. and in that 2007-8 season, uh, the Giants had started out 0 and 2, and were coming to Washington D- to DC to play the Redskins, and 
And uh, he, he called on me and asked if I'd be willing to talk with the team. So that was the first time that I publicly spoke with a, an organization outside of the, the Army. And, uh-huh. and um, you know, I'm in, a, in a roundabout way, I'm sharing many of the, uh, the thoughts that I'm sharing with you today mm-hmm. uh, with the team in a much more probably succinct manner and story and and you know I'm 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 giving way too much credit but they say that that kind of helped turn their season around and mm-hmm. and uh, and that and that they, they um, you know they it, it culminated when the Giants beat the undefeated Patriots in Super Bowl 42 uh-huh. so that was my first Super Bowl ring uh, and then Super Bowl 46 four years later we mm-hmm. did it again when we beat the Patriots so mm-hmm. so. That's an incredible relationship there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, and look, I, you know, I wasn't around him full time, but, um, but it also is, it's a little bit of an insight of, about leadership. I mean, about, uh, and I say maybe communicating, you know, communicating, um, perspective, communicating messages and, and, mm-hmm. and, um, and, and, um, it's, you know, it, you know, I, I I look at pro sports a lot, and you and you know they they all have it's almost like they're almost like special forces organizations. So so why are some so horrible, and why are mm-hmm. some so good? Mm-hmm. So, well, mm-hmm. what what's the difference? It's, it's the leadership. Mm-hmm. Leadership matters, right. and yeah. and you know it matters. What's the difference between a good army unit and a bad army unit is typically the leadership, not mm-hmm. the, not the individuals in there. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Um, so, that, I mean, that gave you a unique, unique perspective then. I mean, I, I imagine, uh, were you nervous when you went in to talk to them for, for the first time? I mean, yeah, I was, cause I didn't really know I was going to say to them. Sure. Right, yeah, right. yeah. I mean, I have a, I didn't have a speech written out. Yeah. So, yeah. um, yeah, so it was, well, it worked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. At least had a had a good effect there. You know, I was struck. I was watching a, a documentary, and we talked a little bit about this a second ago, sir. Um, you know, watching a documentary about that and, and your involvement with the Giants throughout that season, and and you had folks uh, like the coach and then Michael Strahan and, and saying how they were uh, inspired by what you uh, you know your your journey that you've been on and what you came to to share with them. Um, but I was also struck because in turn, you had the same kind of compliments for them. And you, and there were some conversations in that documentary where you said, Hey, you know, you guys are putting it all out there. Uh, and you respected what the sacrifice that they were making on the field. And so there seemed to be that mutual respect for the journey that each side, each person was on. Well, um, you know, real, one of the things that really happened for me was, you know, I was, um, you know, I, I was, uh, almost, uh, probably, close to depression after, you know, um, you know, after getting out of ICU and I was up in a war because I was, I wasn't with my team. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had never been redeployed before my unit. And all of a sudden I was like, I didn't have a team. Right. right. And, and so they became my team. Um, And the fact that they, that, I felt like they relied on me. I relied on them because mm-hmm. I was part of something. Right. Um, right. That's right. And so um, that's where, that's what, I mean, it was just a, it was like, I couldn't have picked a, a, a softer landing spot in terms of, of me not being with my battalion more and something filling the void. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That was, that was amazing. Right. Right. Um, my, a recent XO that I worked with, um, uh, Stony Portis, he was the company commander at Cop Keating and, and, uh, uh yeah, and, in Afghanistan, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and he, and he says that after that event, um, he's got some great observations about how the unit came together to try to repair itself because they had to continue to fight. And so how do you get through a traumatic event like that right. and still maintain the cohesion necessary for everyone to heal, but still fight? You right. know, that's a, it's an important dynamic. It maybe gets overlooked sometimes. I think we, uh, no, uh, I think it's, um, it's, um, it, it's significant, and and you know I don't want to over, I I, I don't want to even uh, imply the over importance of of uh, my my me my unit losing me, mm-hmm. but um, I was super proud that they were able to function, uh, you know, a month plus, uh, and without me there, mm-hmm. and um, 
Uh, in fact, uh, I, you know, uh, I ran into General Jack Keane uh, quite a few years later, and he happened to have been over there as a civilian um, uh, during the surge, and, and he went to visit my unit the next morning. I was wounded. Oh, he wow. found a, and, um, and he says, uh, he really, he, uh, one of the, one of the most comp, most, one of my most proud compliments is that he told me that he said, you know, you trained your guys well because they were functioning without you. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, uh, and that meant the world to me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was like four or five years later, but <laughs> It, uh, it's one that I, I'm very proud of. Losing a, that's a big deal, losing a senior leader like that. It really yep. is. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I have, a, um, I have a little uh, flight crew checkbook that uh, they were able to circulate through the battalion. And, okay. and, uh, and I have notes from, you know, from the vast majority of my soldiers uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. Uh, that they sent back. And, I mean, it's just I can't even get through it without just uh, breaking down emotionally. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, well, as we wrap up here, sir, um, I'd like to ask you if you could inject one um, value, one personality trait, one quality into into junior leaders across the army, into every one of them. You know, what what would that be? Um, they, they just need to focus on their job. Not, you know, look, you know, don't worry about their career. Don't worry about where they're going. Just do your job. Mm-hmm. You know, love your soldiers. Learn, learn. For, Love to learn how to take care of your soldiers. Mm-hmm. Embrace your non-commissioned officers and uh, be humble, mm-hmm. be present, and be your best. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That transitions into really the, the, the legacy that you leave. Uh, like you said, your first battalion commander, you know, those seeds that were planted years and years ago come to fruition later on. And yep. Yeah, everyone's got that inf- influence there. Right, yeah, for sure. Uh, well, good, sir. Um, well, I want to thank you uh, for uh, for taking a moment to to chat here today. Yeah, no, I appreciate what you're doing for the army and and sharing this and and um, you know using this platform, using your talents to 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 to, to better our force. I mean, um, there's a lot of things you could be doing, and and I know this. You got other. I know you got a full time job. So I, um, I appreciate the opportunity to participate. Oh, good. Well, Colonel Gadsden, thank you so much, and I look forward to hearing you talk here in a couple hours. Yeah, absolutely. All right, all right, cool. What I really appreciated in speaking with Colonel Gatson was the candor with which he shared this traumatic turn in his life and how he continually credits others with helping him get through it. His message is one of perseverance and humility and perspective in the face of great trial. And he continues to inspire. So right now, I encourage you to go find a colleague or pick up your phone to share this episode with your network. I know someone out there needs to hear his message. Please remember that the views expressed here do not represent the Department of Defense or the U.S. government in any way. I want to thank you for tuning in to the Military Leader Podcast today and lead well.